Hey everybody, uh, welcome back to another episode of Homebrew. This is episode six, I think. Um, and our discussion today is about what the asking price on a home means for you as a buyer, um, how it's arrived at, what factors might go into it, and how to perceive it. Yeah, no, this is a very interesting topic. So imagine this, um, you know, Friday night, I see a home listed on Zillow and it's listed for $800,000. It's a home I really want, right? And then... Like it's located in the right spot. It's located in the right spot. It's priced, you know, reasonably. And then, you know, a few days go by, um, it's sold for a million dollars. So it's sold over $200,000. Yeah. What the hell happened? Yeah, did you did you try to make an offer on that house? Um, I did, did not because I was looking. I, I I was looking at multiple homes, and I thought, you know, let me decide which homes I want to make an offer on. Mm-hmm. But this is a home that I really liked. It was on my top list, and uh, I did unfortunately did not make an offer. But it's crazy the the price that it sold for. Yeah, like I would have not thought to pay a million dollars for a eight hundred thousand dollar home. Yeah, so so let's break down and unpack like kind of what happened there, right? So who are the different parties that are involved with coming up with an asking price, right? Um, it's There's a seller that's involved. Mm-hmm. They have a number that they want to reach and that they believe their home is valued at based on some fundamentals, mm-hmm. other homes that are sold nearby that tell them, hey, it's worth this much. And then they have some personal you know, aspects built into that number as well because they've lived there maybe or they've owned it for a long time and they think it's unique in some ways, right? right? So there's a percentage of both fundamental and personal. And then number two, there's a seller agent. And there are people that um, more often than not, hopefully, are uh, well-versed in the market. They understand what things can sell for, what things in a home are actually valued by buyers versus mm-hmm. not so much. They try to help the seller understand, you know, you know, that reasoning a bit and what they've seen in the market and try to bring that insight to the seller, right? Yeah. So it it seems like emotions and fundamentals play a key role in determining the asking price or the listing price. Yeah. Some, I mean, most often, yes. Um, And then the, the third party really involved in this is the buyer. Mm-hmm. And they have they have a similar approach as well, right? Like fundamentally, how much is this worth based on what the market has been doing? Mm-hmm. And then how much is it worth to me because I might be spending most of my time there or I might be I might see an opportunity in this home that others don't. Um, I might think that there's a pot of gold in the bottom of the yard. I don't know. Um, or I might strike oil, right? So there's, these are like sort of the three parties that are involved ultimately. Um, And of course with the buyer, there's a buyer agent as well. Right. And so they're there to try to give guidance to the buyer about what the home could really be worth Mm -hmm. based on their insight in the market and what they're well versed in. Interesting. So how, so it's the fundamentals and the emotions, but what factors go into determining asking price or the listing price yeah so it, there's there's effectively three methods right that we see is like number one um people try to set the market mm-hmm. right they seller agents and sellers have maybe maybe it's a new development on the street new construction they think they're better than everybody else all the values on the street are better because um yeah maybe there's low supply of this type of home in the area. And we think that people are going to really, you know, try to um, be a participant participant and buyer um, in trying to buy this home. So they try to set the market and they say, hey, even though it might be worth seven fifty, they try to shoot for the moon is what they call it mm-hmm. and go for like 800 as an asking price, right? Mm-hmm. And they might build in some cushion around knowing that they're going to have to leave it on the market for a bit. Um, to wait for that right buyer to come by. And they, mm-hmm. they'll stand rigid. They'll say, hey, this is our price. And over time, you'll see that price drop just a bit, just a bit, just a bit, just a bit. And this, you often see this in like uh, high-priced luxury neighborhoods, big mansions, 
again, where there's a lot of unique factor um, and people have the the ability to carry a home, you know, even while they may not be living in it, for example, mm -hmm. or um, test the market. So they try to set the market. And so they work with a seller agent and say, hey, you know, this is what I, this is what I want. And they're going to try to shoot for the moon effectively. Mm. Um, the next is, is sort of the, the, the very opposite, right? And we saw this a lot in COVID and we had all this news about home prices, you know, going up so much. And, and yes, they did go up. Absolutely. Without a doubt. We had the most appreciation per month we've seen ever mm. um, on a percentage basis. But what seller agents were doing is, I mean, they're able to sell these homes within a couple of days of even putting on the market, which is great for them. You know, they spend very little time to effectively get someone in the door. Mm -hmm. But what they're also doing is they were being very lazy about pricing the home appropriately. They were, because there was so much transition and change going on in the market and, and, and the value of a home to people went up so much, they wanted the market to decide what the home was worth. Mm. And so when, based on fundamentals, a home was clearly worth 700 k they would price it at like 599 And what that does, and this is what every seller agent tries to, tries to help a seller do ultimately, is get as many eyeballs on that home mm -hmm. and build up as much hype about it as they can. And so what happens when you see a, a home as you did for 800 k you probably had a rush of people at the open house. People saw each other and they thought, wow, everybody must really want this thing. Mm -hmm. And so... Either it was, it, was, it was definitely priced low. Some people probably knew the fundamentals and knew that it was worth more to begin with before they even walked in the door. Mm -hmm. But all the folks that didn't know that before they walked in the door, when they did walk in the door, they definitely believed it was priced low because everyone and their mother was there. Mm -hmm. The other problem during COVID is there's, and it still is a problem, is that there just is, is a really huge lack of supply on the market. So there's... There's general interest. General interest is high. So what that does is it, it, it perpetuates belief that people have about the value of the home and everyone's interest kind of backs off of other people's interest. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately the price goes way above asking. It was artificially priced low to begin with. There's all this hype built up, eyeballs, and then people seeing other people effectively drives up price. Hey man, I, I, I've been stuck in lines for, you know, hours yeah. just trying to get into a home that I want. And it's, the line just goes around the block. Right. So what's this, um, what's the third approach? All right. So, and the, the third approach that people use when they are trying to price a home is, is effectively pricing it at market. Mm -hmm. Right. And so pricing at market is saying based on fundamentals, um, this home because of other homes nearby that recently sold is worth this much and it's reasonable and it makes sense. And you probably saw this happen more often in the city of Boston, for mm. example, during COVID, a lot of people left the city. There was this rush to, to go to the suburbs. And so um, agents were probably trying to price uh, condos, for example, at the, the market price of what it was worth between now and the last six months. Mm -hmm because those are comps. They price a condo 800 k it'd probably sit there for a bit because the demand had gone down so much in the city. And they were doing the right thing. They were mm -hmm. trying to, you know, they were saying to their seller, hey, you know, Boston's a resilient city. Uh, we have clear comps that value this condo 800 k mm -hmm. And they probably put it, you know, they're asking price at it by 800 k But unfortunately, the demand just... Wasn't there. Yeah, wasn't there. Yeah. And so it sat on the market and it slowly came down. So, th but that was pricing, you know, from an asking price perspective, that was pricing it at market. And that's sort of the third way. Um, but the demand in that case just wasn't there and then just during COVID. So those are the three ways. So I kind of know the three methods, how the price is determined. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, you know, imagine I'm a novice buyer, home buyer, and I'm coming into this. How do I win? Like, what do, how do I look at this price? And like, how do I determine that it's too high or too low? Yeah. How, how do I approach it? Yeah, so 
And this is price discovery, really, right? Yeah. Um, at its core, it's like, well, I see this this home; it's priced well, and you know, if 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 for some time in like in this market, very clear seller's market in most places, um, you see the perfect home at the perfect price. You you want to understand whether it's priced right or wrong before you go and spend all this time going to look at the home. You know, and in this case, if the price is already going to go 200k over asking, it goes out of your budget, right? Yeah. But you also want to do this on a home that you you, you like. Yeah. Um, you don't want to do it for every listing that you look at uh, on Zillow, but a home that you know kind of passes that initial review. I like that home. Yeah. I wonder, you know, if that's the right price I should offer. Absolutely. I mean, uh, it would be it would be tough to do that for every home. So uh, do it on the ones that you aren't saying to yourself, hey, this is suits my needs. Um, it's well located mm. and it's worth spending the time on to kind of dig in further. Yeah. Um, so what we do at, at New Home is we try to provide you fundamentals whenever you need them. Mm. Right. So it's very on demand. Um, what we found during COVID is that uh, tied to this very issue you bring up is like, well, I see the perfect home. It's priced in my budget, but is it going to go way above or is it kind of at market or is it priced artificially low based on the three methods we talk about, methods we talked about? So you can request a pricing analysis from us. It's a custom report we send back to you within a day. Mm -hmm. And um, you can look at the the homes that we would call what, what's called comparable mm -hmm. to the home that you are interested in purchasing uh, based on desktop information that we have. And we try to make a judgment on pricing and, and it builds in <clears throat> the activity that's been happening in the market as well. Like during COVID when there was just huge shortage of, of supply and still is, um, it tries to build in for that as well to sort of target or project a pricing rather. Interesting. And so we found people are asking for these, you know, this report before even going to see a house because they're like, I want to know if this is a waste of my time or not. Got it. Got it. That's that's pretty interesting to me. Yeah, that is interesting. So um, I get this report, and it tells me, you know, it gives me some comps to kind of compare. Mm. It also provides me, you know, some information about what the agent thinks the value of the home is. Um, how do I know that this is like, I, I know a lot of people don't see their primary home as an investment, but ultimately, ultimately it is. And how do I know that this is a good investment for the future? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, so everything is about timing. Right? Yeah. Whether you buy a stock today, whether you buy a home today, both are investments. Mm -hmm. Maybe there are different types of investments, but um, you are trying to make a decision based on what you know today about that investment. Sure. You may not always know the future. In fact, you don't ever know the future for sure, right? But you may have a belief about the future. Mm -hmm. And so that is speculation. Mm -hmm. That is hype. That is, I believe that the city of Somerville is going to continue to grow exponentially in value. Um, and there's nothing to stand in its way. Sure. Right? Sure, yeah. Uh, and so that's, you know, on the real estate side of things, similar to how you might value a stock as well. It's doing your homework about a certain area, mm -hmm. understanding if there's maybe developments coming down the pipeline. Um, you know, are are there improvements being made to the city or the town that uh, people might view mm -hmm. positively? Is there a big zoning change coming along? Is it going to uh, increase development? Um, is there population growth um, in my town? Is it starting to trickle up? Mm -hmm. um, Population growth effectively means there's more demand, which effectively means the value of your asset or your home should go up. Um, unless the rate at which homes are being built mm -hmm. is equally as quick. Right. But usually it's not. There's usually but, a gap. Yeah. Um, there's a housing housing shortage. shortage. There's a huge housing shortage. Right now. I mean, yeah. they, I, think, I think people are saying between something like four and seven million homes mm -hmm. is, is what we're behind in this country. Yeah. The other thing that we tell, you know, uh, our home buyers is that you know look at this long term, look at it from a five to ten year perspective. 
um, a lot of people get caught up in this like up and down trend. But if you zoom out, you can see real estate in, in a, in a uh, city like Boston is upward yeah. over time. Yeah, and 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 again, that's that's a little similar to stocks in a way, right? Like you see dips, mm-hmm. but depending on what you're buying, of course, like you should see some of them continue. I mean, the S and P's just continue to grow. If you look at that over time, even if you include 08, of course. Right. Um, but I just want to take a minute and just talk about how people might value a stock and how they might value a home. Right. Um, I know they're very different decisions Mm -hmm. and they're very different access points, but you know, you invest in stocks pretty regularly. How do you draw a comparison between when you're making a decision to buy a home, uh, understanding it's personal because you might be living in that house Mm -hmm. And when you're buying a stock, like what are the things you do um, that are similar, you know, in both cases and dissimilar? I think ultimately you're looking for a return, right? So if I'm approaching my home as an investment, I do want to make a return. I I do want to, you know, grow my equity. And I want to make sure that when I do sell it, I sell it for for a profit, right? And similar, similar to stocks, I want to return. And I look at the fundamentals of the stock. I look at you know the company profile, um, and then there's there's this level of speculation, right? I val- I might value the trajectory of this company uh, differently from you know what you value it, um, but I can foresee certain things that the company is doing uh, that might increase the value mm-hmm. of that of that stock. So, based on you know those two factors, the fundamentals, and you know my personal feeling and strategy that I have, uh, whether it be speculation or not, um, I make the call. Yeah. Um, but with stocks, you know, the information is right there, right? You can zoom in, zoom out with graphs and look at the numbers and, you know, look at the charts, uh, with homes, there is a lot of data out out there. It's just not as structured and accessible, but there's very key questions that the buyer can ask, um, and there's tangible things that the buyers can look at to determine potentially where the market could go. Um, like you said, you mentioned, you know, is the city developing? Is the city growing? Is the population increasing? Are there companies moving in? Um, so those are, yeah, those are key factors. I think, you know, as you're looking at a home in, a, in an investment perspective, or if you're looking at a stock, th- there's some similar things that um, you need to approach uh, both assets with yeah. um, to help you determine if that's a good good buy or not. Yeah, and not to get too too off topic, but like the interesting thing about a stock is like you can buy multiple of them in one go instantaneously almost, sure. and you can sell them the next day. So like the transactional cost to buy a home and a, and a stock is very different. Mm-hmm. Um, also, the, the the price discovery is quite different because prices could change overnight on a stock uh, and be realized in the market. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas for a home, uh, it doesn't happen as quickly, um, and it's not it's not realized as quickly either. Right. Um, but the other piece of it is like you can only buy one of that type of house. Yep. Right, and that you, you can't just make another house just like that on that same corner and strip it off an assembly line or you know on a Robinhood account. Right, and so you know what I think is interesting between buying a stock and a home. The difference is like in one, like the competition uh, on a home is is between you and others that are trying to also buy for that same home. So it's kind of like access competition. Mm-hmm. Whereas for a stock, it's about you and the price that you want to buy it at. It's more about price competition. It's mm-hmm. like I'm waiting for this stock to go to a certain price to reach that, to make that purchase. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, there's there's like big fundamental differences, obviously, because in a house, if you're trying to live there, it's your shelter. It's the home you live in. It's, yeah. you know, where your family might be living. So there's all kinds of personal reasons. Um, but I just find it interesting because a lot of people view both and they are investments. Uh, sometimes, you know, in home buying, we always say like, you know, the first step is about meeting your needs and wants. Mm-hmm. And then it's more about the investment piece of it. Mm-hmm. Um, because if you, you know, ultimately don't like the home you live in, then that's going to cause more of a problem than, the, than the, the, the price you bought it for. Yeah. 
Um, so just going back to that original, um, you know, point where I was making, you know, that home for 800000 that sold for a million dollars. Yeah. It's really ultimately what the buyer values the exactly. home. Exactly. Right? So it could be, you know, whatever price, the listing price or asking price up there. Obviously, you want to buy the home under asking price and, and save money. But ultimately, the value will be determined by the buyer. By the market. By the market. Exactly. Um, and so... And in that case, that buyer, you know, paid two hundred thousand more than asking price because they valued it two hundred thousand dollars more. Exactly. And so, as a as another buyer, what we always say, okay. So the headline of, of the blog that we wrote about the video that we're having here, that we're talking to you, is like asking price doesn't mean much, and that it's just a number. Mm-hmm. And and we the reason we believe that is because. The value of the home is is how the market values it and what the next buyer values it at. So it's it's less about how the seller has is, is valued it. Mm-hmm. It's more about who the next buyer next to you is is valuing the home for. And so it's a really interesting thing because people are always comparing the outcome to the asking price. Mm-hmm. But if if people are artificially lowering the asking price, like one of the methods we talked about, um, or if they are making the price too high and, and then sellers say, oh, they didn't meet my asking price. It, it's You're mixing strategy and outcome, and that's not apples to apples a little bit. But again, I think the takeaway here is that buyers need to understand what the market is willing to pay for a place. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, that's your strongest data point. And that comes back to fundamentals. Mm-hmm. Um, and if we know that a home is going to go over asking price, Forget about asking price. Don't get caught up in it. Mm-hmm. It's just a number. Yeah. It's it's a way to invite the crowd. Right. So focus on what we think the market is going to value it at. And then the last piece of it is how much do you really want it? Yep. Um, because ultimately it's the home you live in.